Greetings to you all, ladies and gentlemen, once again. My name is Dr. George Xavier Corza, and I'll be taking you here for another session for the clock videos. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with your friends for future videos. Alright, so I noticed that from the last video session that I recorded, I missed question 18. So I'll start from question 18, and then I'll move on to continuing to question 24. So question 18 goes as follows. Um, Alright, so always remember to start from the end of the question to understand what the question is seeking from you and what you need to understand. Alright, so this newborn can be assessed as, okay, so the internal organs are without any pathologic alterations. So we know that we are going to be assessing a newborn and um, you need to be aware of that. Alright, an infant, what? has been born at 41st week of gestation 41st week of gestation the pregnancy was complicated with severe gestosis of second trimester so we have severe gestosis of second trimester the weight of the baby is 2400 grams the height 50 centimeters objectively the skin is flabby layer of the subcutaneous fats is thin hypomyotonia is observed and neonatal reflexes are weak and from the options our answer would be full term infant with prenatal growth retardation all right so reason for this is because usually uh, when you're looking at terms so I use um, 36 to 42 weeks for me to know whether the gestation is normal or not. Uh, some literature may differ a little bit in terms of the weeks. But so in general, it's clear that this child is a full term infant. However, the weight of the baby is, is a bit low. So in terms of the standard weight, uh, it should be near from at least above uh, 2.5 or 3 k 3 3 3000 grams when you're looking at the standard weight of the child so in this case the child's and the child's weight is 2400 grams hence it's, it's low that's why we are talking about um prenatal growth detonation also um the the fact that the child has hypomyotonia and weak reflexes can also help us understand that we have um, prenatal growth relation. So moving on to question 24. Question 24 is as follows. Sorry. Question is what is what disease is most likely in this case? So we have a 40 year old man with acute, acute onset of disease caused by overexposure to cold. So we know the reason why they have the pathology is of overexposure to cold. Temperature is increased up to 39 degrees Celsius. Foul smelling sputum is expectorated during coughing. So foul smelling sputum. And we know the patient is also really coughing, though we don't know how long the patient is coughing for. On physical examination with, with various moist packles, which can be auscultated above the third segment of on the right side. So blood test reveals that there's uh, 15 uh, by 10 to the power 9. Leukocytes, in terms of distribution, stab neutrophils are 12%, ESR is 52 millimeters per hour, and then x ray shows that the third segment on the right has a focus of the shadow of 3 centimeters in diameter. So, third segment, the shadow of 3 centimeters in diameter, low density with fuzzy smooth margins, so margins are smooth. And clearing at the center. So, what is most likely going to happen? What What is the the most likely cause in this case? So, to start off with, based with, from the patient's symptoms of a fever, uh, a foul smelling production of cough, and the presence of of crackles that are present in the right segment or above the right third segment. We can understand that the possible pathology would be a pneumonia 
In addition to that, the patient also has a high leukocytic count, high neutrophil count, and high uh, erythrocyte sedimentation, which means that the patient has some sort of infection. Uh, and the findings on x-ray help to support this diagnosis. So in our case, the, the diagnosis is straightforward. It's a pneumonia complicated with an abscess because the abscess is present on x-ray, which shows a shadow with 3 cm in diameter with smooth margins and a clearing in the center, which is basically um, pointing towards an x-ray. Okay, moving on. So the question 25. What kind of therapy is recommended in this case? So we have a patient, 48 old patient, was found to have diffuse enlargement of the thyroid gland, exophthalmia, weight loss of 4 kg in 2 months, um, 4 kg, heart rate of 100 beats per minute, and BP that's elevated. Identification acts as normal. Alright, so from the symptoms, we can understand that our patient is, is suffering from hyperthyroidism. The reason for mentioning that the patient is suffering from hyperthyroidism is, be is because that the patient has, first of all, diffuse enlargement of the thyroid gland, which is a physical feature that is uh, an enlargement of thyroid cells. Then we also have exophthalmia, which is quite quite common in patients with hypothyroidism, as well as the weight loss of 4 kgs in 2 months, which in this case would assume as unintended weight loss. The heart rate is rapidly increased and the blood pressure is slightly elevated, which also unsupports diagnosis. Usually when you're talking of hypothyroidism, what is common is Graves' disease, which is an autoimmune disease that affects the, the thyroid gland as a result of the thyroid stimulating antibodies which would stimulate the re release of thyroid hormones. The, the, the antibodies would be acting as if they were thyroid stimulating hormones. Anyway, so the, the drug of choice would be Mecazolo. Why? Because it would help to reduce or minimize the effects of the thyroid hormones. Okay, so moving on. At question 26. So question 26 wants us to understand what neurological indicators are considered to be specific to this disease. What indicators are specific to this disease? Alright, so first of all, we have a 26-year-old woman. 26-year-old woman is suspected of systemic lupus erythematosus. So already from reading these two statements, you already understand that you need to be aware of specific indicators that would help you diagnose systemic lupus erythematosus. So the reason they are saying that the patient has systemic lupus erythematosus due to the systemic lesions of the skin, systemic lesions of the skin, vessels, joints, serous tunics, heart that developed after photosynthesization. So remember when you're talking about the pathophysiology of systemic lupus with mitosis is first of all an autoimmune disease that is going to affect your collagen and connective tissues. Hence, it usually has a systemic distribution. The following is detected. Early cells antibodies to native DNA, isolated antricentromere antibodies, rheumatoid factor with a ratio of 1 is to 100. Wasserman reaction is positive for circulating immunocomplex is 120 units. So from all these indicators, the one that's more specific to it is DNA antibodies. That is the one that is quite quite specific for systemic lupus erythematosus. So as I mentioned earlier, this is an autoimmune disease. Symptoms usually vary between people and can be mild to severe. So common symptoms include painful and swollen joints, chest pain, hair loss, mouth ulcers, swollen lymph nodes, 
feeling tired and a red rash which is most commonly seen on the face which is why usually in patients with systemic lupus erythematosus we talk of or we talk about exposure to sunlight causing exacerbation of the disease. In terms of the mechanism, it involves an immune response by autoantibodies against the person's own tissues. Now, anti-nuclear antibody testing and anti-extractable nuclear antigen form the mainstay of serologic testing for systemic lupus erythematosus. Some types of anti-nuclear antibodies such as anti-Smith and anti-double stranded DNA antibodies which are linked to systemic lupus erythematosus and anti-histone antibodies which are linked to drug-induced lupus erythematosus. Uh, if you're looking at the drug-induced lupus erythematosus, another drug that can cause it would be example hydralazine which is commonly used as an antihypertensive in emergency cases. So anyway, for our case and for our answer, DNA antibodies would be the correct choice in this case. All right, so moving on to question 27. All right, the question says, what is the most likely diagnosis? So we need to figure out what is the diagnosis. All right, so what we have is a 27-year-old woman who came to the doctor complaining of an increased body temperature of up to 37.8. Now, this is not yet fever. This is subfebrile temperature because for you to think of fever, it has to be more than 38 degrees Celsius. That's when you can start to more fever. So this is subfebrile. So... Together with the subfebrile temperature, the patient also has sore throat for the last three days. Objectively, mandibular lymph nodes are enlarged up to three centimeters. All right. And then palatine tonsils are also hypertrophied. Palatine tonsils enlarged to some extent with a gray coating which spreads to the ovula and the anterior pillars of the fossils. So our diagnosis will be oropharyngeal diphtheria. The main main reason why it's oropharyngeal diphtheria is because of uh, the gray coating. Sorry, the gray coating that spreads to the uvula and anterior pillars of the fossils. That's the main, I'll say the main hint that can help us understand why it's all for your diphtheria. Now, the other symptoms are, let's say, non-specific or they're common, they, they're common to diphtheria and other things that can cause tonsillitis, but the gray coating that spreads to the uvula and anterior pillar fossils is specific to oral for your diphtheria. In some cases, they might go on to mention to you that if you try scrapping off this gray coating, it results in bleeding. All right, so diphtheria is, is basically an infection that is caused by Cronobacterium diphtheria. And symptoms usually take about two to five days to develop following exposure. They usually okay gradually and they usually begin with fever and sore throat. Now the gray patching usually is seen or the gray coating can be seen in the oral cavity. Some cases or in some cases this can actually block the airway which can result in a barking cough which is seen and, and croup. So to some extent we can talk about it presenting as laryngeal and in most cases would see swollen cervical lymph nodes or mandibular lymph nodes as in the case. Now comparing to other diagnoses, so basically tonsillitis is inflammation of the tonsils which usually has rapid onset and in some cases it occurs together with pharyngitis, so it can be tonsillar pharyngitis. So symptoms are also similar to diphtheria in that there will be fever, so throat enlargement of tonsils, trouble swallowing, and large lymph nodes. And then complications include peritonsillar abscess, 
However, the distinction between tonsillitis and oropharyngeal diphtheria is that there wouldn't be any gray quartering that you'd be seeing in this case. And then in terms of oral candidiasis, this is basically an oral thrush, which is caused by candida, which is a yeast infection. And in terms of the clinical appearances of candidiasis, it can be pseudomembranous, pseudomembranous coating of the individual opacity of the central membranes with white slough that can be easily wiped away and review erythematous reddening and sometimes minimal bleeding of the mucosa occurs. However, so so the bleeding in uh, in diphtheria is 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 more evident than that of uh, candida and in candida it's quite quite rare to have bleeding uh, and if it's present it's going to be quite minimal. It's not something to worry about too much. And usually it develops in patients that have immunodeficiency or in, in, in babies due to other various reasons. So when you're talking about, for example, an HIV infected person, they can have candida occur as an opportunistic infection when the CD4 count is, is quite low. So in terms of appearance, it looks as if it's a coated cheese. And then in terms of the signs and, and symptoms, you can also have fever, sore throat, and an enlargement of, of lymph nodes. Alright, so moving on to question 28. 28. Alright, so the question is seeking for us to know what is the most likely diagnosis? What is the most likely diagnosis? Okay. So we have a preemie gravida at the term of 20 weeks, which com all complains of pain in the lower abdomen. So term is 20 weeks. So premier gravida means that it's the first time they're getting it's the first time they're getting uh, pregnant. Premier gravida who complains of pain in the lower abdomen. So in the lower abdomen. Smearing blood streaked discharge from the genital tract. So smearing blood streaked discharge from the genital tract. Uterine tone which is increased fetus is mobile. Vaginal examination reveals that the uterus is enlarged according to term. So uterus is enlarged according to term. The uterine cervix is shortened to 5 cm, 0.5 cm. And then the external cervical orifice is opened by 2 cm. All right. So from all of this, our answer would be that we have an, a risk of late abortion with hemorrhage. Now, the reason why we are saying that there is a possible abortion is because we have a patient who has a 20 week of pregnancy and they are presenting with a blood streaked discharge, which could uh, with an open cervix as well, which means that an abortion would typically be occurring in this case because it's, it's too early for you to be delivering a viable fetus at 20 weeks. And the reason why it's, it's mentioned that it's a um, late abortion is because it's occurring in the second trimester. If it was occurring in the first trimester, then it will be regarded as early abortion. So, so basically, that's that's all I have for this question. All right. So we move on to the next question. Question twenty nine. So the question is saying, what would be the early indicator of therapy effectiveness? Early indicator of therapy effectiveness. So we have a sixty five year old man. So age sixty five man. Uh, diagnosed of B twelve. Deficient anemia and which treatment was prescribed. So probably they were just given B12 supplements, which usually are given as, as subcutaneous injections. So a week later, control blood tests was performed, and what would be the early indicator of therapy effectiveness? So in this case, it's increased number of reticular sites. So increased number of reticular sites is basically 
the indication that is increased blood, blood production, which is a sign of therapy effectiveness as these cells will increase the number of mature red blood cells that are formed as the process continues. Now, reticular cells by character are immature red blood cells without a nucleus, having a granular or reticulated appearance, hence they call reticular cells, when suitably stained, and high number of these would be an indication of increased hematopoiesis. So, so yeah, so this is also another, I mean, straightforward question if you if you can understand the, the part of physiology or the physiology behind the disease. So moving on to question 30. All right. So what pathology is most likely caused by these clinical presentations? We need to diagnose them. So we have a 35-year-old female who complains of heart pain. So heart pain. Occurring mainly in the morning. So mainly in the morning. In autumn and spring, and irradi irradiating to the neck, back, and abdomen. R rapid heartbeat and low vitality. So, tachycardia and low vitality. Occurrence of the condition is not associated with physical activity. And in the evening, the patient's condition improves. So study of somatic and neurological status and ECG reviews no pathology. So ECG reviews no pathology. So what pathology is most likely to have caused these clinical symptoms? So our answer here is that there is somatic depression. All right. So the reason why somatic depression is the answer is because here. At the end of the question, they, they tell you that the study of somatic and neurological status in ECG reviews no pathology. So basically, there's no organic cause that is present for for this disease. So basically, the other word for somatization is psychosomatic disorder. So basically, this is when you have a psychological disorder of some sort that would result in appearance of symptoms or, or physical symptoms although these will not be related to any organic damage or organic disease so that's one indication to inform you that you probably have a psychological disorder so it can occur with depression or it can occur with other psychological disorders as well so you need to to rule out some some other diseases so in terms of the description for somatization it's basically a psychological dysphoria through bodily symptoms. Patients usually complains of physical signs, which they attribute to a medical disease and seek medical help for, but the symptoms do not fulfill the diagnostic criteria of an organic disorder. And although somatization is not known to be associated with psych although it's known actually, sorry, although it's known to be associated with, with many psychiatric disorders. It's common with depression or anxiety, as I already mentioned. Now, the other reason why I was already ruling out uh, organic causes is because of the character of the pain. So usually when you have stenocardia or ischemic heart disease or coronary artery disease, if it's stable angina, you're going to have a patient that's going to have pain on physical exertion. So that's going to be main main feature so in other you can actually get a question on stenocardia and then they'll always mention to you that the patient when they exert themselves for example if they run or go up a flight of stairs they have chest pain which usually lasts about five minutes and gets better with rest that's basically stable angina and then unstable angina is when you already have a patient who has a diagnosis of stable angina but now the patient's symptoms are no longer responding to the nitroglycerin so usually patients with angina are given sublingual nitroglycerin and in patients with unstable angina they will be no longer responding to sublingual nitroglycerin or it will be 
it'll be taking more time actually. So it'll probably take like 15 to 20 minutes to, to respond. And the occurrences will be much more frequent than usual. Hence, you can think of unstable engine. Or in, in some cases, it can even be as long as 30 minutes of no response. But however, in unstable in China, there are no ECG changes as well as in, in stable in China. But if you're talking about a myocardial infarction, um, there you'd definitely have ECG changes, which can be either ST segment elevation or ST segment depression, depending on how deep the infarction is and how many vessels have been inf uh, uh, have been affected by the myocardial infarction. All right, so that's that's it for question thirty. I'll move on to the next question. That's which is question thirty one. All right, so what is the most likely diagnosis? All right, so a question wants to diagnose something. All right, so on the fourth day of recovery from a cold, fourth day from a cold, patient is hospitalized with complaints of solitary spittings of new cold sputum. On the second day, of hospitalization probably is a single discharge of about 250 ml of purulent blood streaked sputum that's more or less like a cup a cup of blood or sputum that is um, produced in this case objectively the patient's condition is moderately severe respiratory rate is 28 to 30 pulse 96 BP 110, uh, respiration over the left lung is vesicular, over the right lung is weakened or reduced. There are various moist crackles over the lower lower lobe and amphoric um, 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 bread sounds near the angle of the scapula. Alright, so so from this question, we can already, and this, so our answer, or our answer is acute pulmonary abscess. So usually pulmonary abscess would occur in a patient who has had uh, probably pneumonia or any other sort of infection. The reason for thinking that it's um, an abscess or a pneumonia, first of all, is based on the patient's symptoms, especially when they go on to mention that uh, the patient has... Uh, when they go on to mention that the patient has had a discharge of 250 mls of purulent blood strict discharge. So this is when the abscess would have ruptured, probably, and then um, resulted in a discharge of, of such an amount. So the respiratory rate is increased. So the normal respiratory rate is usually 12 to 18, but it should be different. In some cases it can be 12 to 20, but in this case, either way is elevated. And then pulse is 96. So if you're in Ukraine, uh, some teachers teach that pulse should be 60 to 90, but internationally the recognized rate is 60 to 100. And then BP is, is normal. So in addition to, to, to these findings, so in addition to, to, to tachypnea and possibly tachycardia, we have an, a decrease in, in A entry. On the right lung, as well as uh, moist crackles that are auscultated, which are also highly indicative of of pneumonia, which would be complicated with abscess. So this this question is actually similar to the other question that uh, we did in the in the previous videos. If you guys had watched them, so the reason why it's not acute focal pneumonia is because acute focal pneumonia wouldn't necessarily present with a large amount of sputum with blood although it can produce sputum but not a large amount so so 250 ml is like a cup of, of sputum so it's, 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 it's a lot so so pyoneumothorax is basically a complication of the abscess rupture which would cause pus and air in the pleural cavity which is not the case all right so moving on so we go on to question 32. 
So the question is, what is the most likely diagnosis? So we have a 65 year old woman, 65 year old woman on abdominal palpation presented with a tumor in the umbilical mass. Sorry, a tumor in the umbilical region. And above and above it, in the umbilical region and above it, the tumor is 13 by 8 in size, moderately painful, non mobile, and pulsating. On auscultation, you have a systolic murmur. And then our diagnosis is that the patient has an abdominal aneurysm. So, looking at this patient, the reason why we're saying that it's an abdominal aneurysm, the, the most, I'll say, identifying feature that helped me diagnose it is uh, the fact that the mass is, is, is basically pulsating. So usually a pulsating mass in the area of the umbilicus is, in most cases, more likely going to be an abdominal aneurysm. Also, <clears throat> Uh, in addition to this, the patient's age, so the patient's age is 65, so remember to always think of the age, the patient's age is 65, and in these patients, it's quite common to have aneurysm, so they commonly occur for patients that are already over the ages of 50. So abdominal aneurysms usually are mainly asymptomatic, and usually they are discovered coincidentally on routine checkup. And in some cases, if they're symptomatic, the patient may present with back pain. And in any older patients will present with back pain, which they should have the abdominal region populated to rule out abdominal aneurysm. So in terms of the diameter, so usually if the diameter of greater than three centimeters of enlargement of the abdominal iota, would be more likely an abdominal aneurysm. And the risk factors for abdominal aneurysm would be age, first of all, which is uh, greater than 50, and more commonly in men or the previous family history. Although in our case, we had a female, so we don't know much about the family history. And then high blood pressure is also another risk factor. Smoking would also be another risk factor to consider. All right, anyway, that's it for question 32. Moving on to the next question. We have question 33. So what radionuclide is the cause of this irradiation? All right, so this is more or less a cramming question for me because I didn't get much information about it. So a 45 year old man complains of cough, fits and tickling of the nasal parents. Cough and tickling of the nasal parents. He had been staying 10 days in a polluted area created by the Chernobyl nuclear power plant accident. So Chernobyl and accident rhinoscopy shows signs of nasopharynx irritation. Question is what radionucleotide is, is involved. So, so it's it's going to be radioactive acid. So I, I guess it's due to the fact that radioactive iodine was what was being kept at the plants or the nuclear power plant is why I would probably suspect that in this case. So like I said, this is a cramming question. I have no not a lot of information on this. Alright, uh, moving on. Question 34. So question 34 is asking us to make a provisional diagnosis. Alright, so we have a 20 year old man with severe headache, double vision, which can be in some cases known as tetropia, weakness, fever, and irritability. Body temperature is 38 degrees Celsius and the patient is reluctant to contact sensitive stimuli. So in this case we can say that they are probably just just guessing they might be 
Was ist das Wort? Äh, photophobic or, or sensitive to light, which, which can be a stimuli or sensitive to, to loud noises. The artosis of the left eyelid, exotropia, anescoria, S greater than uh, D, which is sinister greater than, than dextra, which is left greater than right. And a pronounced meningeal syndrome, so which now helps you understand that probably what you have is meningitis. So on lumbar puncture, the cerebrospinal fluid flowed under the pressure of 300 millimeters mercury. The fluid is clear, slightly opalescent. 24 hours later, there appeared a fibrin film with protein equal to 1.4 grams. Lymphocytes 60 over 3 per millimeter cubic, cubic millimeter, and sugar or glucose is, is less than 3 millimoles. And then our diagnosis is tuberculous meningitis. So, from the symptoms already, we have a suggestion that this patient is probably suffering from meningitis of some sort due to the fact that the fluid is clear and high. High pressure on on evacuation of the cerebrospinal fluid. So what helps us to rule out meningococcal meningitis is due to to bacteria or to nasaria meningitis. Is the fact that usually in meningococcal meningitis, what we're going to have is a cloudy cerebrospinal fluid as well as high neutrophils and high lymphocytes. In this case, we have high lymphocytes which are highly suggestive of TB meningitis. So, tubercular meningitis is caused by micro to, to mycobacterium tuberculosis, which would be affecting the meninges, which is which are the membranes that surround the central nervous system. So, in terms of diagnosis, this is made, of course, using a lumbar puncture by assessing or making an assessment of the cerebrospinal fluid. So when collecting the cerebrospinal fluid for, for TB meningitis, a minimum of one milliliter of fluid should be taken. And the cerebrospinal fluid would be high on protein, low on glucose, and raised in the number of lymphocytes. So this is typical for, for TB meningitis. And then compared to meningococcal meningitis, which would be high on neutrophils. But uh, bacterial meningitis would also be low on glucose because bacteria love eating glucose and also would be high on protein as well. But the main significant difference is the amount of neutrophils. So lymphocytic or Armstrong's chorio meningitis is a rodent bone viral infectious disease that presents with aseptic meningitis, lymphoencephalitis uh, or meningoencephalitis. And in this patient's history, there is no evident exposure to rodents, which is why we would not be thinking of such as a diagnosis. All right, so moving on. We have question 35. What criterion are asked to determine the severity of the patient's conditions? So, how can we determine the patient's? Uh, the severity of, of the patient's condition. All right. So we have a 37 year old worker during a fire. So, 37 year old worker during a fire ended up in an area of high carbon monoxide concentration. He was delivered to a hospital. In an unconscious state, objectively, the skin of his face and hands are crimson, which, which is red color, so we, we can just say they're hyperemic. Uh, respiration is 20, in this case, would be on, on the marginal part of being increased. ECG solves alteration specific for hypoxic myocardium, which would be, in some cases, um, depression of the T wave. 
hourly diuresis is 50 ml. Blood test shows erythrocytes 4.5 to 10 per part half per liter. And then hemoglobin is 136 grams per liter. Color index is 0 0.89. Sorry, erythrocyte sedimentation rate is 3 millimeters per hour and carbon monoxide is increased to 5 percent. So what criterion allows determining the severity of the patient's condition, which is basically carboxyhemoglobin concentration. So the carboxyhemoglobin concentration would allow you to know the severity as this bond reduces the amount of oxygen that can bind the blood and thus reducing the supply of oxygen to the tissue especially the brain so you should always remember that the brain is is the organ that consumes a, a huge amount of, of of your oxygen and uses it for energy so carboxyhemoglobin the, the reason why it's such such a um, dangerous thing to deal with is because it's um in terms of affinity, carbon monoxide has a high affinity for hemoglobin compared to, to oxygen. So carboxyhemoglobin is a stable complex of carbon monoxide and hemoglobin that forms in red blood cells upon contact with carbon monoxide. Carboxyhemoglobin is often mistaken for the compound formed by the combination of carbon dioxide and hemoglobin, which is actually carbo, carbo, amine, carbino carb amino hemoglobin so exposure to small concentrations of carbon monoxide in the ability of hemoglobin to deliver oxygen because carboxyhemoglobin forms more readily than oxyhemoglobin so looking at the structure of the hemoglobin itself hemoglobin contains four heme groups each which are capable of reversibly binding to one molecule of oxygen and then oxygen binding to any of these sites causes a change in the protein, facilitating binding to each of the other sites. Now, if carbon monoxide was to bind to the same site of oxygen, um, in terms of the affinity or how tight it can bind to the, these um, sites, it's 210 times tightly or more likely to bind to it than oxygen. All right, so so basically that's it for this question. I'll move on to the next question. So question thirty six says, what is the diagnosis? What is the most likely diagnosis? All right. So after a case of prolonged otitis, a one year old boy has developed pain in the upper third of the left thigh. So after a case of prolonged otitis, otitis. Now your boy pain in the upper third of the left thigh. Temperature is 39 degrees Celsius. Objectively swelling of the thigh in its upper third. So that's an examination. And then smooth out and then going to fold. The limb is in semi flex position. Active and passive movement are impossible due to severe, severe, severe pain. So in this case, our diagnosis is, is going to be acute hematogenous osteomyelitis. The reason for saying that it's osteomyelitis is because the patient initially had a prior infection of otitis media and the common um, bacteria that can cause otitis media includes strep pneumo, it can be moraxella catarralis, or it can be hemophilus influenza. Now these bacteria can then later on spread via bacteremia inside the blood cells, then reaching the thighs and then can cause osteomyelitis. Now the symptoms and the, the signs are also suggestive of osteomyelitis. So this is basically a classical presentation of epiphysial type of osteomyelitis. So in, in patients with an infection in any area of the body are at risk of epiphysial osteomyelitis, 
as a result of hematogenic spread of the infection from one side to another. And the children usually present after a history of infection which later develops into bone pain. Uh, we should always suspect epiphyseal osteomyelitis. So, so basically that's it. That's your answer in this case. Alright, so moving on. Question 37. What medication should be used to provide emergency care? So what medication should be used to provide emergency care in this case of positive test result? So we have a patient with suspected fear of homocytoma. Fear of homocytoma has normal blood pressure and the periods between the attack and the tendency of tachycardia. The so urine test reviews no pathology was decided to use a provocative test with histamine. What medication should be prepared to provide emergency in the case of a positive test result? So our answer is fentolamine. The reason being is because fentolamine is a reversible, non-selective, adrenergic antagonist. So primary application of fentolamine is to control hypertens hypertensive emergencies. Um, which can commonly can be seen in, in fewer homocytoma. So the provocative test using histamine as well would, would result in dilation of the smooth muscles of the blood vessels, which would cause a, a, a severe drop in blood pressure. So fear homocytoma is a neuroendocrine tumor of the medullary area of the adrenal glands originating in the chromophore cells. Or it can also originate from extra adrenochromophilin tissue that failed to inoculate after birth that secretes high amounts of catecholamine, mostly no epinephrine, and then to a lesser extent can be epinephrine. Now, the main effect of catecholamine, which is of great concern, is its stimulation of severe vasoconstriction via stimulation of alpha 1 adrenergic receptors. So basically, this is why we always need to have fentolamine because it's going to result uh, or it's going to act as as an antagonist uh, in cases of a positive test result. All right, so moving on. So question thirty eight: What drug would be the most effective? For termination of the cerebral, so also we're doing with some pharmacology of cerebral crosses attack. So what we have is a 42-year-old woman, so age, don't forget the age, with a severe pulsating headache in the frontal parietal area and vertigo and palpitations. She has been suffering from hypertension for the past three years, okay? Significant increase in blood pressure occurs two to three times per month, which should also be eight hours. And the left ventricle is enlarged, heart sounds clear, heart rate is 105, which is increased in this case. Blood pressure is severely increased. And then ECG signs reduce left ventricular hypertrophy. So basically what we have here is a hypertensive emergency because we have severely elevated blood pressure with symptoms related to the target organs which are damaged. So our drug of choice here would be labelo. So other drugs, so captopril is also a short acting antihypertensive that can be used but I guess for the sake of croc labetalol is, uh, is the drug of choice that's preferable com compared to captopril. Now the other antihypertensives, yes they're antihypertensives but they don't have any effect in terms of um, using them during the emergency case where you need to decrease the blood pressure at a much quicker pace. So these ones hydrochlorothiazide and losartan are prescribed um, for the patient and outpatient department, clonidine is not, not used anymore because it was known to cause 
severe depression or due to, to high side effect profile is no longer being used in practice anymore. So labetalol is a medication that is used to treat high blood pressure and also for long-term management for angina. This also includes essential hypertension, hypertensive emergencies and hypertension in pregnancy. So in essential, hypertension is generally less preferred than a number of other blood pressure medication. It is a beta blocker which works by relaxing and slowing the heart rate of the patient. So in our patient we also had an increase in heart rate which is also why we would prefer to use uh, a beta blocker as well. So this is the best drug in management of this patient is that would produce uh, more favorable outcomes and help to terminate the cerebral crisis attack. All right, so we have question 39. So what is the disease that is primarily suspected? So we have, what we have is a 45 year old man complains of pain in the epigastric region. So he has pain in the epigastric region. Okay. And the left subcostal area, abdominal distension, diarrhea, and loss of weight. So he's been suffering from this condition for about three years. Sorry, for about five years. I don't know why I said three years. Okay. So, <laughs> so he's been suffering from this condition for about five years. For about five years. Objectively, the tongue is moist with a white coating near the root. Deep palpation of the abdomen reduces my pain. The epigastric region and Mayo Robson point. Now, liver is painless but protrudes by one centimeter from the costal margin. Spin cannot be palpated. What is the diagnosis that can be suspected in this case? Now, this diagnosis is consistent with chronic pancreatitis. So for the sake of caucus, simply because of this point that they mentioned, uh, the Maya Robson point, which is the area of the pancreas. So I, I would say this is more common for Ukrainian teachings. And then what else is, so the patient also has diarrhea and weight loss. So in, in, in cases of chronic pancreatitis, you would also have diarrhea, weight loss, uh, it will be rare to have vomiting, but diarrhea and weight loss will be quite common. And then you also have, um, what else would you have? Abdominal pain, that is uh, in the epigastric region, especially in the myoropsal point. And the fact that the patient has been suffering from this condition for the past five years is also highly indicative that they have been having this pathology for a long time. All right, uh, so I guess that's about it for today, guys. Thank you very much for for your attention, your time, and everything. Uh, I'll be looking forward to the next video. If you have any suggestions, feel free to put it in the comments. Don't forget to uh, press like, subscribe, and please share with your friends. My name is Dr. George Xavier Kozer. I'm signing out, and I'll see you next time.